Let's start with the dangerous and slowly work our way towards the most deadly outlaws on the list. Number 10, Clay Allison. Clay Allison was nothing short of a wild man, a notorious gunfighter who earned a reputation for being extremely violent. Like in 1870, when Allison led an angry mob to the local jail to break out a man named Charles Kennedy, who had recently been convicted of murder. He would break him out of his cell, only to lynch the man himself. But for Allison, the man was not dead enough. So he began to decapitate the man as well, placing his head on a stake and proudly displaying it at the local saloon, which of course, traumatized all of the children who were coming in for a drink. Allison was such a wild man that he would oftentimes be seen riding his horse through town, completely naked, with nothing but his pistol on his hip. But my favorite incident was when Allison accepted a dinner with a man named Chunk Colbert. Chunk was a notorious gunfighter who was rumored to have killed seven men up to this point. And it was no secret that Chunk wanted nothing more than to see Allison dead. Now, of course, Allison knew this, but he still accepted Chunk's dinner invitation nonetheless. While in the middle of eating dinner, out of nowhere, Chunk would jump out of his chair and quickly drawing his gun to shoot Allison dead, only to hit the edge of the table with his pistol, which prevented him from raising it up any further. And in one swift motion, Allison drew his weapon, shooting Chunk between the eyes. When asked by the locals, why on earth would he ever accept dinner with a man he knew wanted to kill him? To which he replied, because I didn't want to send a man to hell on an empty stomach. Number 9. Cherokee Bill Crawford Goldsby, or better known as Cherokee Bill, was an infamous outlaw who was responsible for the murder of 8 to 13 men. Bill would become an outlaw in 1894 at the age of 18, when he would confront a man that had beaten up his brother. But once he was face to face with him, he realized he didn't want to get beat up as well. So he would just end up shooting the man instead. And from this point on, he would live the rest of his life on the run as a wanted criminal. Shortly after this incident, Cherokee Bill would join an outlaw group called the Cook Gang, which specialized in robbing banks, trains, and stagecoaches. Cherokee Bill's crime spree was long and involved many heinous crimes. But to better understand this man's insane work ethic, let's just take a look at a small section of his crime spree. Starting with June 17, 1894, when Bill shot and killed Deputy Sheriff Sequoia Houston in a gunfight. Then one month later, Bill would even clock in for holiday pay, shooting and killing two men on the 4th of July. Then two days later, on July 6th, he was rumored to have killed a railroad worker. Then a few weeks later, on July 30th, Bill and the Cook Gang robbed the Lincoln County Bank in the Oklahoma Territory. As you can see, Bill's crimes were non-stop, and they would continue at this pace until the day he was caught, which came on January 31st, 1895. But even in jail, Bill's silvertooth activities would continue, as he somehow managed to get his hands on a revolver. And in an attempt to escape, he would end up shooting a jail guard in the stomach and back. But it would all be for nothing as he would be locked back up in his cell. And on March 17, 1896, Cherokee Bill, the most infamous outlaw of the time, would be hung for his crimes. And just moments before his execution, he was asked if he had any last words. To which he replied, I came here to die, not make a speech. Which is just a total cop-out, since the man obviously had a fear of public speaking. Number 8. George Parrott now, most of the outlaws from the Wild West had some of the coolest nicknames. Names like Billy the Butcher, Shotgun John Collins, Pistol Pete, James Wild Bill Hickok, Kevin Black Eye McLuffin, Texas Jack, Bronco Bill, The Kentucky Cannibal. The last one might still be up for debate. But my point is, most outlaws had really cool names. But sadly for George Parrott, he got stuck with one of, if not the worst one, as he would be known as Big Nose George, or Big Beak Parrot. And with a nickname like that, it's no surprise that the man was very angry, and went on to commit some of the most disgusting crimes, from robbing trains, stagecoaches, and cattle, to the classic Wild West pastime, cold-blooded murder. 
and after many years of crime, it would all eventually come to an end. On August of 1878, Big Nose George and his gang would attempt to derail a train in Wyoming by removing a stake from the tracks. But to their surprise, they would be spotted by a railroad worker. Knowing that they had been identified, they quickly fled to Rattlesnake Canyon. But what they didn't know is that the gang was being followed by two lawmen. These two lawmen had a very unique set of skills, as they were specially trained to track criminals down. And as they began to track the faint footprints left by the gang's horses, they would eventually arrive at Rattlesnake Canyon, where they were easily spotted and murdered. After these killings, a large bounty of $20,000 was placed on George's head, which is over $600,000 in today's money. But it wouldn't be until 1880 that George would finally be captured. Once in jail, things would take a shocking turn when George would get his hands on a pocket knife and sawing off his shackles, which he used to smack the jailkeeper over the head and fracturing his skull, only to be held at gunpoint by the jailkeeper's angry wife, who was obviously very disgusted with what she saw. Her once ugly husband was now ugly and deformed. News quickly began to spread of George's escape attempt, and a large group of 200 people would rally and come to his rescue, breaking him out of his cell. Once he was set free, a rope was quickly tied around his neck and he was lynched. It turns out the group was an angry mob. George's skull was then used as an ashtray for many years, and his skin was used for a pair of shoes. Both his skull and shoes are now proudly displayed in museums. Number 7. Bill Doolin. Bill Doolin was an outlaw and founder of the Wild Bunch Gang. They were responsible for multiple crimes from robberies to outright murder. Doolin's crime spree mostly took place in the Oklahoma and Indian Territory and lasted from 1892 through 1896. But it wouldn't take long for the Wild Bunch to become one of the wealthiest and most powerful gangs in all of the Wild West, amassing an estimated value of $165,000, which would be over $5 million in today's money. Now, depending on when you're watching this video, that's about the price of a really nice single family home or the price of a used pickup truck. The gang was so successful at robbing trains and banks, the states had no choice but to place large bounties on all of the members. They were wanted dead or alive. And by 1895, most of its members had been killed, either by lawmen or bounty hunters who were out seeking the reward. Bill himself would be captured and jailed on January 15, 1896. But just six months into his jail sentence, he would manage to get his hands on a revolver sticking up one of the jail guards and forcing him to unlock the jail door and escaping, leading to a massive manhunt that would end with Bill being cornered inside of a farm. Surrounded by lawmen, he was ordered to come out peacefully. And a few moments later, Bill would walk out and shooting at everyone that surrounded him, only to be instantly put down with a shotgun blast. It turns out that a 1v20 is never a good idea. Number six. Jim Miller. James Brown Miller, or better known as Killin' Jim or Killer Miller, was an outlaw, a professional hitman, and a lawman. Killin' Jim was a notorious gunman who is considered one of, if not the most violent man of the Wild West. It's estimated that he killed a minimum of 12 men, but some reports claim that the number could have been as high as 50. Those reports, of course, coming from Jim himself, which we can all agree is genius marketing. Now, some of these killings were justified as they were committed against criminals early on while he was a lawman. The others, on the other hand, were just unlucky, as those were just outright cold-blooded murder, with most of those taking place once he switched sides and becoming a notorious hitman, charging $150 per hit, which is about $5,000 in today's money. And for the next few years, Jim was hired to kill many men. And in 1908, he would get hired by three wealthy men to kill a former deputy U.S. Marshal named Alan Augustus. The plan was simple. Pay Jim $1,700 to kill Alan. And once he was dead, the three men would acquire his land. So the following day, Jim would ambush Alan on his property, shooting him twice with a shotgun. As Alan was left to die on the floor, his wife would run to the scene. And in his final words, he would manage the strength to say the name Jim Miller.
soon. Jim and the three men that hired him were captured and arrested. They were all taken into custody to await trial. But word quickly began to spread that there wouldn't be enough evidence to convict the men for this crime, so the townspeople would take justice into their own hands, breaking all four men out of their cells and dragging them to a nearby barn, placing all of them on a platform with a rope around their necks. As the other three men cried and begged for their lives, Jim showed no emotion. He was just eager to get the show over and done with, yelling, let her rip! and voluntarily stepping off his platform to hang himself. The rest of the men were not so brave and would be taken care of by the angry mob. Number five, Sam Bass. Sam Bass was an infamous train robber and the leader of a gang called the Sam Bass Gang, a gang that would become famous when they pulled off the largest train robbery in American history. But before we get to that, let's first cover Sam's origins. Believe it or not, Sam tried to live an honest life working many jobs. He was a cattle wrangler, a horse racer, an advertising sign spinner. Okay, one of those I might have made up. At one point, he would even work for the railroads, where he would load goods onto the carts. Sam could have continued to live an honest life if it wasn't for his gambling addiction, in which he accumulated enormous debts that he could not pay off, which is what led him to a life of crime. He would begin by robbing stagecoaches, but eventually he would put together a gang that would specialize in robbing trains. Using the knowledge he acquired while working for the train companies, he managed to pull off four consecutive train robberies outside of Dallas, Texas. But in 1878, Sam and his gang would pull off the greatest train robbery of all time. When they managed to rob a Union Pacific train, stealing $60,000 worth of gold, a value that is close to $2 million in today's currency. And after this robbery, the gang would immediately split up for good. The following year in 1878, Sam must have gotten bored of being retired and rich. So he would put together a new gang. And on July 19th of the same year, they would attempt to rob a bank in Round Rock, Texas. A robbery that would have been successful if there hadn't been an outlaw turned informant in his gang. And once the gang arrived at the bank, a shootout broke out. With his gang being shot and killed, Sam would take off on his horse, escaping town. The following day, Sam would be found helplessly laying in a pasture north of town, covered in his own blood from a bullet wound he suffered the day before. He would be rushed back to town, where he would die the following day. Number 4. John Wesley Hardin John Wesley Hardin had to have been the most psychopathic killer of the Wild West, committing his first crime as a child when he stabbed a classmate after a fight. Then in 1868, at the age of 15, he would take it a step further. When he began to argue with the man, but not wanting to risk being wrong, he would quickly settle the argument by shooting and killing the man instead. After the murder, he would go full Jason Bourne, killing three Union soldiers who tried to arrest him. And in 1871, while traveling up the Chisholm Trail, he killed another seven people, then three more in Abilene, Kansas. And in the coming years, he would add an additional four men to his death list. By 1878, Hardin had killed at least 20 men, but some reports speculate that it could be as high as 40. The murder of a former state policeman and a sheriff would be the ones to get him arrested. John Wesley Hardin would then serve the next 14 long years inside of a Texas prison. After serving his time, he would eventually be released. And in 1895 in El Paso, Texas, Hardin's girlfriend would get arrested for carrying a pistol. Hardin exploded with anger, threatening to kill the officer who had arrested his girl. A few hours later, Hardin would be spotted at the local saloon shooting dice when a man walked behind him and shooting him in the back of the head. He would be dead before he ever knew what was happening. The man who had shot and killed him was the same officer he had threatened a few hours earlier. The officer simply did not want to take the chance to end up on Hardin's death list. As for the officer, an El Paso jury would end up acquitting him for the murder of Hardin, as they felt that he had done the town a favor. Number 3 Jesse James Jesse James is perhaps the most famous outlaw of the Wild West. James' appetite for violence began at the very young age of 16, when he joined a guerrilla group called the Bushwhackers. 
which is not at all what it sounds like. The Bushwhackers were a pro-Confederate guerrilla warfare unit during the Civil War and carried out some of the most atrocious crimes against Union soldiers and anyone who supported them. Let's just take a quick look at two of these incidents. Beginning with the Lawrence Massacre of 1863 in Kansas, where 150 unarmed men and boys were killed. Then there was the Centralia Massacre of 1864 in Missouri, where 24 unarmed soldiers were executed. A young Jesse James took part in both of these incidents. But now that you know exactly who Jesse James is, let's continue. After the Civil War had ended, Jesse, his brother Frank, and some former Confederate guerrillas would come together, creating a gang called James Younger Gang, which would soon become the most feared outlaw gang in all of American history. The gang would first begin by robbing banks, trains, and stagecoaches. Now, the reason this gang was so feared was, well, they never hesitated to kill anyone who got in their way. The door guy at the bank. The bank teller. The man who just happened to walk into the bank while they were robbing it. The little orphan who previously got squished crossing the road in my second video. The James Younger Gang terrorized the U.S. from 1869 through 1879, robbing over 20 banks and countless trains during this time. Now, the crazy part is that Jesse James and his gang were treated like local celebrities. Since they were seen as standing up for the Confederate movement, they were constantly sensationalized and romanticized in the newspapers, which garnered them a ton of local support. It actually got so out of hand that when the gang robbed the banks and stagecoaches, crowds would begin to form and watch from the sidelines, hoping to get a peek. But after 10 long years of crime, the gang would finally dwindle down, as many of the members began to die in shootouts. And by 1879, only Jesse and his brother remained. With the bounty on Jesse's head becoming larger and larger, he would ask the Ford brothers to move in with him as the brothers were the only two people he trusted, as they had been members of his gang in the past. They agreed to move in. And on the morning of April 3rd, 1882, while James was hanging a picture frame up on his wall, one of the brothers shot him in the back of the head. The two brothers collected the reward money shortly after and were later exonerated for the murder. Number two, Billy the Kid. Henry McCarty, or better known as Billy the Kid, was an outlaw and a deadly gunfighter. Billy the Kid's life would dramatically change in 1874 at the age of 15, when his mother would die from tuberculosis. Their stepfather, not wanting to raise Billy and his brother alone, would end up abandoning them, leaving both of the boys orphans. With no one to look after them, they began to steal food to survive. Eventually, Billy would be caught by police for his robberies and placed inside of a local jail. During the night, Billy somehow managed to shimmy up the cell chimney and escaping from his cell. And from this day to the day that he died, Billy would remain a wanted fugitive. For the next few years, he would join multiple gangs committing many crimes, from robberies to murder. He would even be arrested several times. But by the early 1870s, Billy would settle down working an honest job as a cowboy for a man named John Tunstall. John was a businessman who had many enemies in the business world. And in 1878, with the help of the town's sheriff, those enemies sent a large group of men to seize John's cattle. As John went to confront the men, the group would end up shooting him in the chest, knocking him off his horse. As he laid on the floor, one of the men would walk over to him and executing him with a shot to the back of the head. Little did these men know, they had all but sealed their fates. This incident would mark the start of the Lincoln County War. A group called the Regulators was created. The group's goal was simple. They swore to kill every single man that took part in John's murder. Billy the Kid was one of those members. It didn't take long for the Regulators to begin getting their revenge starting by killing the two gunmen that murdered John. And in 1878, the regulators would ambush the town sheriff and his deputies, killing them all in a shootout. The Lincoln County War would last for around a year, with many killings taking place. After the war was over, Billy the Kid would become a wanted man for the murder of the town sheriff, 
and in 1880, he would finally be captured and jailed. He would be sentenced to hang for his crimes. But Billy had other plans, and on April 28th, 1881, he would get into a fight with one of the jail guards, stealing his revolver and killing him. Then from the second story, Billy would taunt the second jail guard when he yelled, Look up, old boy, and see what you get. And the moment the second jail guard looked up, he was blasted with a shotgun that Billy acquired from their office. Billy the Kid had managed to escape from jail once again. A $500 reward would be placed on Billy the Kid. He was wanted dead or alive. Many men and bounty hunters began to track him down. And on July 14th, 1881, Billy's luck would finally run out when he would be killed by Sheriff Pat Garrett with a shot to his chest. Billy the Kid would go down in history as one of the most legendary outlaws of the Wild West. It's speculated that Billy had killed around 21 men during his short time on Earth and was just 21 years old at the time of his death. Number 1. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid Robert Leroy Parker and Harry Longabaugh are two of the most famous outlaws of the Wild West, but most will know them by their nicknames Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. The reason why they're both in the number one spot is because they would become partners. But before we talk about how they became Wild West legends, let's first cover the origins of Butch Cassidy, the man who would become the leader and founder of the Wild Bunch Gang, a name that was inspired by Bill Doolin's gang, which we covered in the number 7 spot. Butch began committing crimes at an early age, from stealing cattle to minor offenses. But it wouldn't be until June 24th, 1889, that he would cement himself as one of the most brilliant outlaws the world had ever seen. When Butch and three others successfully robbed the San Miguel Valley Bank in Colorado, escaping with around $24,000, which is equivalent to around $800,000 today. The reason why a robbery this large was successful was thanks to Butch's meticulous planning as he scouted the targeted area for weeks, taking every single escape route into consideration. Butch also had custom leather bags made to withstand the weight of the loot that was to be collected. He would also create an escape system where multiple horses would be stationed along the escape route, creating a relay system of fresh horses, guaranteeing that anyone pursuing them would not be able to keep up. Butch simply left nothing to chance. Tactics like this were the reason Butch and the Wild Bunch gang were successful in robbing multiple banks and trains for over a decade. Now the most shocking part is that Butch and the Sundance Kid never shot or killed anyone during these robberies. But after a decade of crime and the increasing pressure from law enforcement, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid were forced to leave the country, making their way into Bolivia, where they would end up getting into a shootout with Bolivian soldiers and both Cassidy and the Sundance Kid would end up dying in that battle. The men were then buried together at the local cemetery. Well, at least that's how the story goes. You see, in the 1990s, their bones DNA was examined and were attempted to be matched with the DNA of their living relatives. But there was a problem. Neither of their DNAs were a match. The bodies of the two men that supposedly died in a shootout in Bolivia were not Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, with some even speculating that both men survived the night of the shootout and returned back to the United States shortly after, living the rest of their lives as wealthy men under a new identity. They might not have been the most dangerous outlaws of the Wild West when it comes to killings, but as far as the banks, the trains, and the government were concerned, there never existed a deadlier gang than the Wild Bunch.